Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. Well, Bitch Talkers, we are at SF Film Fest once again with a director of a film called Bitter Brush. Her name's Emily Madavion. Welcome so much to uh, Bitch Talk. I want you to tell the audience what Bitter Brush is all about. You're starting with the really hard questions. The is hard it really? questions. <laughs> <laughs> nah, softball. No. It's uh, so it's a documentary, and it's about two young women in Idaho, way out in the mountains, who are spending a long summer herding cattle by horseback, way beyond cell phone reception. Mm. And it's about their friendship and the life choices that they're facing. Um, I read in the notes that you met them uh, the summer prior to shooting in rural Idaho. Mm -hmm. Um, Were they immediately up for this idea or did you have to coax them along a little bit? I met, so I actually met one of them and her previous season's partner. And Holland or Holland. So I met Holland and Holland was, um, Holland was on board, but then when she lost that partner for the next season, she had to bring on someone new. And so she brought Coley back, um, who, you know, was an old friend of hers from college and so I had to pitch it to Coley. And Coley is um, really, she's a like, really charismatic, really smart person. And so I went to this brewery. We sat down. We had like burgers. And, and I'm like, nice to meet you. It's like, it's just the beginning of small talk. And she's like, okay, so tell me what you want the audience to, to take away after they walk out of the film. And I was like, I, A, <laughs> holy shit. And B, I can make a movie with this woman. <laughs> You know? Did she go to film school too? Or? No, that was, I was just like, there, there is no better question you could ask a person who's asking you if they can make a film about your life, you know, as, yeah. a, as a starting point. So I, I said something that, you know, was okay, was acceptable <laughs> and things proceeded. Wow. Yeah. Um, she's an interesting person. We'll get into her a little bit later. Um, How did you manage your crew while shooting? Um, Because I'm specifically thinking about the snow scene, which is epic. Yeah. I I love that scene. But how did you manage your crew through all of that? Well, we had uh, had different ways of shooting depending on what we were filming and different sizes of crews depending on all kinds of factors, right? So that the snowstorm scene, which is also my favorite scene, so thank you for picking that one. Um, (laughs) That was, um, so Derek Howard, who's an amazing DP, um, and who can ride horses. Um, I stuck him on the back of a horse and I, (laughs) I had this idea in my head that I was going to get, um, snow in order to show the end of the season. And, and the, the weather had said it was going to snow and we only had a few days with Derek. And then I woke up that morning and it said 10% chance of snow. And I'm like, Oh you know, Mm -hmm. it's like crushing blow that you get in documentary film. And so I told Derek, just get like the little bits on her hat, like anything you can get that'll just suggest that snow is coming. And then it was like, they're just going to ride from here to there. And it was only going to be like, you know, an hour or less this one part of the day's work. And I'm like, so just follow them. And, you know, it's on her black hat, like whatever, just to show. I stick them on the back of this horse and I'm like, I'll drive over to the other side and meet you. And literally, (laughs) this is mountain weather, everyone. This like blizzard rolls in. He had on two pairs of gloves and he was a popsicle by the time he got to the other side. But he just kept going, just kept following her. And and it's incredible because Holland was pregnant. Yeah. She's on this horse in a blizzard. And the dogs. With the dogs. (laughs) And just like, oh, my God. Um, You know, the cinema gods were smiling, but I definitely owed him a warm cup of something yeah, yeah. Something. <laughs> <laughs> a little out booze in there yeah um no that's a beautiful scene um i want to talk about coley's story about her mother mm. um when she's talking about the few days um that she was with her mom while she was dying essentially yeah um 
Did you always want to keep that scene in the film or were there moments or did she want to keep that scene in the film? Were there moments that you might have cut it? Yeah, the um, no, I always wanted to keep it. And and, you know, you as may be clear from how Coley first, you know, interviewed me about the prospect mm-hmm. of the film, they were very aware that I was filming when I was filming. Right there, it, it's not like I was pre- like hiding from them. This sort of fly on the wall thing is not exactly like what's going on. Really, in those moments that are more intimate, it's more that we're hanging out and they're acting relatively natural because they're with me. But they know the camera's rolling, and so um, I told them that they should feel empowered. That if there's things that they want people to understand about their lives, that that's that if they talk about it, then it can be in the film. Mm. Um, so she told that story. She knew that I was rolling. Um, and she, you know, when she watched it the first time, she was just sort of like holding my hand. And and what she said to me was, you know, thank you for honoring my mother. Mm. Because for her, this is, um, this is an important part of understanding what their life is, understanding the, the types of struggles that, that they've faced. And then, you know, and the way that they approach, like Coley in particular approaches, overcoming hardship and and by sort of working on herself transforming her own attitude in order to um you know to not kind of sink under the weight of those things and so that was um something that she was really happy was in the film it was a really poignant scene um and it it talks it it shows how tough her mom is and then how tough i mean she's tough (laughs) She's really tough. <laughs> Both of them are very tough. Yeah. Um, and we didn't even talk about Holland and breaking the breaking the horse. I yeah. maybe we should talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Because as someone who's a city girl and I'm watching <laughs> that, I'm like, oh, the poor horse. But yeah. man, that scene and ha- was that a full day's shot or nope. She got that horse from never ridden to she was sitting on top of it. It was about an hour and fifteen <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It was I mean it is tough. And I wanted it to be, I wanted to show the brutality of the life as well. Mm-hmm. I didn't want it to be a sort of, um, you know, like a mythology of, of, of what this labor involves. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen the film, Holland is like, you know, 115 pounds dripping wet. I mean, she's a <laughs> tiny, tiny person. It's yeah. like no kind of like, you know, like physical heft to her. And so then you have these huge animals. Yeah. And it's like the... The danger that they, frankly, that they do pose to them, um, and this, you know, sort of, you see a couple times in the film where the horses are flipping out or whatever, mm-hmm. but um, it's not explicit that what they're doing is, um, in fact, most of the time, breaking horses or getting them when they only have a couple rides on them, and riding them as part of their work, and then selling them later in the season. And this is part of the economics of the job that they mm-hmm. do is like they're putting the miles on these horses and training them. And that makes them worth more money. And so then when they sell them, this is this is kind of how you get by in this life. But it means that, you know, there they are half the time way outside of phone reception or anything else on these like kind of half wild animals. Mm-hmm. Um, it's brutal. It's really brutal. And the way that they have to um, kind of keep their cool and manage the animal and, and you know, convince these horses that they want to enter into this relationship. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's an easy thing. It was uh, pretty reminiscent of the writer. Yeah. But in, but in the writer is sort of real life. Um, but this was a real life writer to me. <laughs> like, yeah. With women. Um uh, I'm always the person in this uh, podcast relationship. I'm not here with my co-host that talks about the score. And I loved the classical music score because it was unexpected. Can you talk about that choice? Yeah. Well, I lo- I mean, I'm an um, old fashioned piano and Bach loving person because mm. my mom plays the piano. So I grew up with it around. But um, when I when it came time to pick how to score this film, it, I, I really didn't want it to be Western, quote unquote, whatever that would be. Um and I was thinking about it and it seemed like, okay, well, the film itself is quite formal in structure. You know, it's framed by the seasons. Um, and I wanted something that had that mirrored that formality and that also had a kind of emotional depth and and maybe hinted also at 
the the place of these two women's faith in in just their kind of life view. And so that was Bach, you know, it's like it's it's got spirituality, it's emotionally rich, it's highly formal. Um, so for me, that was like, oh, it's a perfect fit. But of course, when you watch the film, it does stand out as one of those clear kind of directorial choices, um, which again was for me fitting to the agenda of not pretending that it's a fly on the wall film, because of course they do in fact look at the camera sometimes or talk to me mm -hmm. in, the, in the course of the film. So I'm not, I didn't want to erase the fact that I had been present and filming and that 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 this, in a sense, is my curated vision of their lives. Um, my last question is, did you, do you get a sense of, like, how many women actually do this job of range riding? <laughs> and are you going to become a range rider? Am I going to become a range rider? <laughs> oh, good Lord, no. <laughs> um, no. Because um, I kind of want to be now. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I lived out there, right? I mean, so I lived there for three years and we still go a lot, Um I love the place, you know, but I, I, I go around it on foot rather than on horse. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how many women. I don't think it's that many. Yeah. Uh, the couple others that are around where we are are mostly all men. But um, that being said, it's, you know, it's gig labor, mm -hmm. right? And on some level, this is just like millennial girls trying to like get buy in a gig economy. And part of me also cynically thinks that whenever we're dealing with gig labor um, or like, you know, when there's less security in your job, like women always get roped in. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, I, it could be that, um, that in fact, daughters of ranchers who are not inheriting the father's ranch, but who love this life and don't have anywhere to go, that this becomes a place that they are going because of that. Mm. Um, I don't have data on it, but it's not, it's also not something that's like super widespread in practice. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on Bitch Talk, Emily. This film is beautiful and I can't wait for it to roll out. Thanks for having me. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions. GoTo Productions.